The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. We're going to deal with three major topics between now and the end of the semester. The first one is today's, and that is, is, what is the relationship between the way a city is made and its form? Is there a relationship between the way a city is made and the form that it takes? Next week, we will start with an examination of the relationship between social, social structure and spatial structure. I'll do case studies of a number of cities next week, probably Jerusalem and Johannesburg. Um, after that, we will look at contemporary form models selectively until the end of the semester. What would be nice would be if you could use the material that we've done, which I suppose is a kind of a history, as a reference to some of the questions that we're going to be asking of current events. Today I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the process by which the World Trade Center in New York was replaced by the Freedom Tower. I don't know if any of you know this story in broad terms, perhaps not in detail. Um, in one of the pieces of reading you will find a comment by Margaret Crawford who used to teach urban design at Harvard. When the article questions whether after Robert Moses there's a process by which New York is still going to produce great things. She says, the story of democracy is one of constant improvement. To look for perfect answers is the wrong way of looking at it. So if she's correct, the important thing is that the result of a struggle to produce a certain form is contingent and most importantly to be, uh, to be oriented towards the conditions of the struggle and the education and learning that takes place, even if the product is imperfect. That argument would mean that the, that the society is constantly in a state of change and is much more likely to be associated with a model of buildings which can change at the same rate as society wishes to change. The Russians are being very intrigued by this relationship. I'm, am I being far-fetched to imagine that Melnikov's project for the Pravda building, which has three rotating cores, has something to do with the speed at which decisions are made and communicated to the public? It's a bit far-fetched. We don't perhaps engage in the relationship between social process and form making in as direct relationship as that. But some people looking at Skidmore's and Merrill's Freedom Tower, which by the way is 1,776 feet high, 
1776 being an important date in American history, <laughs> tries to connect the imperial quality of a building by its height. The Burj Khalifa in, in Dubai is taller. It's over 2,000. Uh, and I don't think there's any attempt in that society to link its height to a particular event in Islam. But we play games. I've listed nine ideas about the relationship between form and social process. And I'm only going to spend our time on a few of them. Um, I want to talk about the concept of relying on a super figure and using the case of Robert Moses in New York. Has anybody read Robert Caro's book? Okay, well, so we use ignorance as all of us. In the case of making decisions, I will use the example of the process by which the World Trade Center was replaced in some detail, the various five stages of its procedure. You are free to take part in this discussion. I'd like to hear your opinion as to some of the assertions I'm going to make. Briefly, I'm going to deal also with the concept of educating citizens. If you see form and people as two items, you can argue that if you change people, you change their way of understanding the form of places. And the number of projects that I want to look at very briefly with you, which focus on changing the nature of people rather than to, you'll again look, look, look back to, last, to Tuesday's class. One of the great concepts of the young Soviet urbanists after 1918 was that they had a new clientele who could be shaped to live up to the um, qualities of the Soviet society, which was new, new, newly being formed. That one of the problems of the industrial city was the fact that the, the client structure was so fossilized. There have been a number of attempts to use urbanism to try to educate people and to change this quotient, this relationship. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on uh, redressing social imbalance. I'll just mention it and give an example of it uh, from Boston and spend less time on confronting the system as a way of changing the society and its form. Uh, Kevin Lynch argues that The real issue in co the contemporary city, and he's really talking about the American city, is that there are a host of agents, families, industrial firms, city agencies, developers, investors, regulatory and subsidizing agencies, and so on and so on and so on who produce a process which at best is fragmented, plural, and bargaining. The public in this case has a number of ways of acting, typically. First of all, there are public works. The public may build infrastructure and buildings at will. He can do so in an uncontested manner. He doesn't have to deal with the market. 
uh, it uh, in some societies, as in Great, well, not in Great Britain, in some societies, certainly in Soviet Russia, uh, all land was belonged to the state, and uh, private ownership of land only became a slower. Uh, I think it's now about 50% of total land, urban land. The public can engage uh, with the private sector in many kinds of relationships. These relationships have modified and been exhausted almost in the range. They range from the classic Seagram's building in New York, which traded off, which the public ceded floor area ratio increases in return for setting back the building to provide public space. There are many more current trade-off situations. There's one, there are many in Boston, the one that I'm thinking of is uh, the new hotel on the waterfront, uh, I forget its name, which uh, has a terrace which uh, 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 runs up against the public garden. The trade-off is that the city has allowed the, the hotel to use the terrace for the service of alcohol and so on in return of which the private firm maintains the garden. There's a lot of maintenance switches. If you look after my house while I'm going on holiday, uh, I will pick up your mail when you come back. This really operates more extensively on a smaller scale, as do most urban design decisions in current urbanism. The third thing that the public sector can do is create incentives. The building of most of downtown of off building, office building in Boston was created by 121D legislation, which gave tax breaks for the building of new office buildings. No, 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 this is, there was no building of uh, new office buildings in Boston during the 50s and 60s, and this comes late. Uh, the John Hancock building, the first John Hancock building, probably dates from about 1960 or so on. They are older buildings, but the spate of new office development was promoted largely by the public sector, deciding that one of the ways to incentivize private market activity was to give use the tax system. The public sector has enormous power in playing around with the tax system. It costs, it's a negative system of cost. You lose what, I, I don't want to go into the economic detail, it's complicated, but, and there are a lot of theories about whether it's good or bad. But this is just an example of where it was used to build a skyline for a city which had no particular attraction to office development. At times the city, and I'm using Boston because there are a lot of local examples, rather than San Francisco, which has used the trade-off of public-private relationships quite remarkably 
in rebuilding the waterfront and uh, there's a building on the war on the river which have houses factories for making pills it's between oh, i don't know what the bridge is called and the other bridge it's next to it's where you come off the freeway uh, it's next to where harvard's business school starts you know the building it looks like uh, i don't know what i mean i can't describe it you could say that this could be the argument the public sector says it we cannot afford to lose jobs this property is within the municipality of boston not of cambridge it pays us to yield a site to a corporation a site which it prefers because of the publicity that it gets in order to stop it from leaving boston and going to another city where it may pro- equally prosper or prosper even more so if the policy is that the river is a sacrosanct public entity which provides enormous benefits to the city hidden and real it should not sacrifice its land on the river for purposes which are not closely associated with human activity not factories you don't put factories on a modern river but you put factories on the modern river in order to keep those jobs this is the kind of complicated way in which the city is made i think it's a very silly stupid decision of short term there's no body authority which maintains the rights of the river they are grassroots organizations which are friends of the river and try to protect the river from pollution and so on but the river is not taken up by the city and in used as a sacrosanct commodity even economic commodity it's willing to trade off all kind of short term benefits keeping biogen it's, i don't know if it's biogen i don't know what the company is the drug company that anyway let's move on the public has two other propositions in its power it can regulate activity it can write bylaws it goes both for protection and for the possibility of incremental change for instance it could tax land um which was at the moment parking lots in the downtown are used as investment in investment centers waiting for the market to reach a point where it you could capitalize on the land fully in johannesburg you tax the value of land at a higher rate than only land itself you assume the potential of building as a function of the cost of the land or the value of the land not the cost of the land and so the public here intervenes by making sure that land doesn't lie fallow for too long so the public can speed up development or slow it down Kevin Lynch in the, in the place Utopia talks about different speeds of development this would be one of the tools 
a, an interesting thesis which looked at agricult urban agriculture in Brooklyn, argued that urban agriculture was one of the modalities of land use which could easily, which was very flexible. It could either remain agriculture and produce goods, or it could give way to more dense development without having to replace buildings. I want to go on. The last function that the public has in this game is education and marketing. In Italian towns in the early Renaissance, towns produced books which were called praise books, which set out to advertise their town. There's a nice little book written by an Italian woman on these books. And uh, there's a parallel literature in, is in Islam called the Fadail books. I think there are three Fadail books about Jerusalem, which set out systematically what the attractions are of the city. It's like I love New York, or a version of making the public possibility that the city has into a marketing device. So the public has an enormous number of powers, and uh, I'm assuming the society is a market society, as I'm assuming that it's most of the propositions which I'm going to be examining will be propositions in a democracy in which um, power will be distributed through systematically, and people will be able to take part in various processes to influence the way the public and the market acts. We'll examine this in the World Trade Center story. We we'll look at it, we'll, well, what the New York Times, what role the New York Times played, what role the CNN played. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. I'm not going to talk about the, the planning technology of decision making. It's arcane and complicated and doesn't deal with physical form. It idealizes certain techniques of decision making and thank you very much. It's not of great interest to me. What we've come to realize, and the, I think Kevin Lynch puts it well, we have a city building process which is complex and plural, marked by conflict, cross purpose and bargaining, and whose outcome, while often inequitable or wanted, seems as uncontrollable as a glacier. He argues this contentious argument, a highly decentralized decision process in which the immediate users of a place make the decisions about its form is an accepted ideal, both because it reinforces the user's sense of competence and because it is more likely to result in a well-fitted environment. This is probably true of us from this is probably true when the scale of the proposition is small and diminishes in utility as the proposition gets bigger. Who do you ask to, dis to make a decision, to influence a decision on whether the Route 495 should be widened? You do a poll. You can do a poll. What utility? How, what? 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 What would you base the, your results on? There are 
young users who are not capable of taking part in the poll. The users who are too young and are going to only be of age once the proposition is completed. They are handicapped people and so on and so on. The utility of user participation in general then is spatially conditioned. If we have one street in Cambridge which needs repair, I think it would be a good idea to talk to the people who live on that street and ask them what needs, what priorities, what, what, what problems do they have? Are there too many dogs on the street? Are there too many holes which are not repaired on the street? It makes an assumption about the unique knowledge that people have about their own situation, which professionals don't have, or only have to a limited extent. And so buying into this unique knowledge is an enormous asset. I mentioned that in the New Towns Committee in London did a broadcast in 1946 asking people what a good size for a town would be. That is the sort of nonsense use of participation. But active participation on a small scale has become almost professionally mandated in the change of an American city. Some people would argue that it frustrates development. I think development has built itself into a position to take account of it. The fees for user participation in the Big Dig project equal the fees for urban design. So the shape of the road and what it which is largely mandated by engineering concerns. You can't say it should be painted red or green or yellow. The real crude rules about which you will understand about maintaining the perceptual quality of automobiles at 50 miles per hour. But the right to terminate, to exit the expressway into Watertown, or no, it doesn't go to Watertown, into Chelsea, requires the probably a bargaining arrangement whereby Chelsea is given a new library by the federal funds that come in to, to pay for the project in order to buy the right for the road to connect at that point. So public participation, which we'll see a number of examples of in the slides I will show you, probably as a summary, is a fundamental aspect of democracy. It requires an educated, not educated, but transparent population. People are educated in different ways. Formal education doesn't necessarily mean that you are much more so that you're sensitive to your own environment. You're probably so overlaid by questions as to how much your property is worth and whether if a black person buys a property on the same street, your property is going to be devalued. These are important questions. The major model f by which urbanism has been transacted and taught has been that the great improvements in cities have come about when great powerful figures, super figures, are in control. Robert Moses is the great American example in 40, over 40 years, he built $28 billion worth of projects, the largest city builder in America's history. I handed out to you a couple of things. 
The first page is some notes I made from Ramparts in March 1975, when Robert Caro's book on Moses was just published. Ramparts was a left-wing radical journal, and it asked these six people on the his names on the left what they thought of Mo, what they thought Moses the problem of Moses was. And I've tried to list on the, in my own handwriting what I think. One of the interesting ones is that is the last one. The second last man, Temko, says that Moses didn't understand architecture. Therefore, he made bad decisions. Berman follows up by saying, Moses actually did understand architecture. Look at Sigrid Gideon's book, Space, Time and Architecture. The flyleaf has one of Moses's elevated highway intersections on its cover. Gideon talks about the similarities between Baroque form and highway curvatures. He talks about the great Borromini building in Rome, the two churches, uh, uh, which is not San Carlo le Quattro Fontane, the other one, San, uh, it's near the Pantheon. Forgive me, I can't remember. My memory is gone. Um, Gideon makes a claim that that we should, and you can well understand Moses' reaction to that claim, that he was actually doing things which were being appreciated by one of the great philosophers of modern architecture. But these are tendentious comments. Let's look at Moses' record. The argument is that good city is a city of grand design, large public works. It's important to have a large figure who can superintend over all the bureaucratic complexities and barriers of city form. Moses, the masses are incapable or unwilling to act. If allowed to intervene, no single product could ever be delivered. You cannot have the changes you need in cities without conflict, hurting some people. Moses is quoted as saying, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. That Moses moved over 100,000 people out of their houses in East Tremont, in the East Tremont, 500,000 people were displaced. This was a neighborhood of blacks, Irish, and Jews. He wished to build the Cross Bronx Expressway. He used private company to relocate people. The company had far offices far away from the neighborhood and never had regular hours. When, a, when an, uh, an available a new apartment was to be looked at, there were four floors of people already on the staircase. Comparable price was never achieved. Demolition, even when people didn't wish to move out, demolition started and subsequent vandalism was used to increase the working, the moving out of the speed by which people moved out. Okay. This is the sordid side of the Grand Master. Moses had charisma. The book starts with him at Yale, as a brilliant student, ideal, 
wanting to dedicate his life to public service, to helping the lower classes. But he was strong, he was a very good swimmer, but he was a nasty man. In the book, he gets, he doesn't help his brother who needs help. All of these things paint a picture of, him, of a flawed master, a kind of a Beethoven who, if you look too carefully, doesn't ever wash his clothes. Uh, um, one of the interesting things about Moses was this, not only the scope of his work. He built 600 miles of highway. He built the Verrazzano Bridge. He built a, a number of bridges. He built a number of centers in Manhattan, the United Nations, the Coliseum, Lincoln Center, all the products of his reign. He was, for reasons which I don't quite understand, convinced that automobile transportation was inex in inexorably the solution to the American city. For instance, the Long Island Express cost $500 million or $500 billion, $500 million, I think, $500 million at the time. It could have added four feet for mass transfer. This would have cost 20% more. It didn't. Or it could have purchased land f and kept it in escrow for further transit for something like 20 million more, but he didn't. How did he achieve this power in a democracy is perhaps one of the more interesting things. How do you achieve such power? How do you achieve such power in a city that portrays itself to be very sophisticated? Well, sophisticated, it is sophisticated in many respects. It is some of the most wonderful restaurants in the world. Uh, and uh, great opera companies and so on. Now, I think the interesting thing that, I, that one learns from looking at this case carefully is that he used the public authority system to build power. Moses was never elected to office in the 40 years. At his peak, he wasn't challenged seriously by any governor of the New York State. He was New York Times in its private memorandum claims to that he could not be criticized in the newspaper um, without special documentation. But he gained his power from he taking over and gaining power in the, the public authority, which possesses not only the powers of a large corporation, but some of the powers of a sovereign state. It has the power of eminent domain that permits the seizure of private property and the power to establish and reinforce rules and regulations. A public authority has two other vital characteristics, controlled by a board of directors, which can be as small as one member, and they can issue bonds. Haussmann understood this. Haussmann in used his understanding of fiscal economics in order to transform Paris. In 1960, he was the sole member of the Henry Hudson Parkway Authority. 
one of three members of the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, Commissioner of the New York City Parks Department, City Construction Coordinator, a member of the City Planning Commission, Chairman of the Mayor's Slum Clearance Committee, Head of the City Office of Civil Defense, Member of the New York City Youth Board, President of Long Island State, oh God, who just goes on, President of the Jones Beach State Parkway Authority, the Long Island Parkway Authority, Chairman of the New York State Power Authority. Having power in so many domains which allows you to reticulate decisions which individual entities can't assume. If I'm on one board and I want a highway to move through a park, you know, I can use this neg the connected power system or the contiguous power system. He also used, he also had a great, and with power comes the capacity in this country and probably anywhere in the world to assume wealth. He got big gifts from the Rockefellers for the you know, building of the United Nations property. Uh, uh, and so on and so on. The question is, what kind of city did he leave New York in? And would we have been worse off had there been no figure like Moses? In our field, we should be able to answer these questions. But there's so many variables Nobody in probably will ever be able to seem, assume the power through the public corporation system as Moses did. We are a completely different set of environmental issues. We have all kinds of different public groups, issues of youth, issues of gender, issues of race, all transcend the importance of a super figure right now. Look at what Mayor Bloomberg is spending his time doing. There's no federal highway construction program, so he's not building any highways, at least none that I'm there. Manhattan is, it's impossible to move through Manhattan because they're building subway, maintain, renewing the gas system and uh, building the Second Avenue subway. Um, so when, when in the history of a town do you need somebody who can assume total power? You'd be able to answer this question. In a democracy, you do so when the society is threatened absolutely. Remember Foucault's rules for what happened during the, when the plague occurs. <coughs> The prob the, one of the problems of the project of environmentalism is that the actual symbols of environmental degradation are not impacting people sufficiently. Not in this country, not in New York. And in a democracy, people will tend to be lazy about a great deal of things which they will suspend until some, that Hurricane Sandy hasn't probably caused much of a change in maintaining flood control 
land and probably will never result in major infrastructural changes. It means that the only way that you're going to be able to get all of this done is probably through a, a waiting for an emergency situation when the cost of repairing the conditions are 5,000 times higher. It's a bleak prospect. It's easy enough to criticize Robert Moses as Jane Jacobs and legions of liberals have done. But it's worth speculating about the state of our business in a democracy. What do you think? Have you thought about Robert Moses ever? What do you what what did you think of him? You must have some thoughts. You must know something about the man, the, the greatest urban builder in this country's history. Not a trivial figure. Are we likely to have people like that again? We are. Even if we put more, uh, you know, uh, lock mechanisms and check and balances, the reality is there are people that have the capability of achieving a lot of power and influence and just drive projects. Yeah. And in fact, oftentimes the population in different places and different cultures do like that. Whether, whether, regardless of it's, if it's proper or not. So there is, there is a part of the population that actually mm, sure. comes with the notion of somebody taking charge. Sure, we are all lazy. Yeah, because we're all lazy. <laughs> and to the extent that I can trade off my concerns about my health to my doctor, yeah. who, if he's kind, he behaves like a psychoanalyst and relieves me of worry, I will do nothing about eating my pills at the right time because he, uh, I found that going to see a doctor and saying that I train at a health club twice a week immediately makes me feel, makes them feel good about me. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside. <laughs> um, the interesting thing is not to, I think, focus on these extremes. To imagine cities as taking, building themselves over a long period of time and being much more engaged in the proper process by which things happen. You know, Moses' work is monumental. So is Napoleon's for the Champs-Élysées and Haussmann for the Boulevard de l'Opera in Paris. Over a period of time, another generation has grown up. Monuments, when we deal with memory and monuments, one of the I forget his name, Robert Musel, a French critic, says, monuments amongst the most forgettable of items we produce. You drive through France and you stop for coffee in the afternoon in a small town and you sit in the square and you look at, at a monument of a man on a bronze horse. He fought in the Battle of Algiers in God alone knows when. No small child in the town pays any notion to him except that there's a monument there. So it is often with cities. We ingest the new very quickly. We assign it to a category of the past. 
it, it, certain aspects of the past gain great value by being so much of the past. How much of a loop process is there? How much are they momentarily lost to doing in, in, in social memory? And people you know, forget about the guy whose monument was dedicated to, but how much in the end those monuments become fixtures in a city and remain? Mm -hmm. Yes, the one in the central square in this little Italian uh, French city that I'm talking about will never, will never gain much leverage in, in that town or anywhere. It's just a gift to, because this man was born there and so on and so on. Let's delay talking about memory seriously when we, in a few weeks' time, deal with Maurice Halfoff's book, The Collective Memory, and the whole idea of monuments and temporary monuments and permanence and temporariness and so on. Um, let's just talk briefly about the World Trade Center. There are a number of actors which started the game. There's the governor, who control, Mr. Pataki, who controls the lease that the, the Seaport Authority gave to Mr. Silverstein, the developer whose towers were destroyed by some nasty airplanes. There's the mayor of the city. There are the victims' families. See, we put them on a diagram together, they all wish to interact in the creation of something which both has utility, has real estate, but has nourishment for loss. It's a tough combination. The mayor and the the governor get together and form a lower Manhattan Development Corporation, which has an, it's another public corporation. It seems to me that in New York particularly, things are so divided that public corporations for almost every single item uh, can be created. And Moses took a lot of advantage of that. The first thing this, the uh, LMDC does is it hires a firm of planners and architects to do, make six different models of the site as what they call placeholders. This is just to describe to the world what you can build on this site. The response to this is very negative. People say this is completely classless, it's unemotional, it's got no guts, it doesn't mean anything, it's just a banal disposition of space. The LMDC, the New York Times attacks this procedure and publishes uh, you can see in the piece I gave you a little extract from its publication. Don't rebuild, reimagine. He proposes a new high road on the west side which links down to Battery Park. It gets Zaha Hadid and Peter Eisenman to design house, funny shaped housing on the road. Uh, it has Rafa Vignoli doing the new subway station. Uh, the LMDC have got to do something. So they decide to do something called an innovative design study. This is not a design competition. They're going to pay selected architects 40000 flat fee of $40,000 each. The, team, the seven teams that take place each paid about $500,000 out of their own pockets just to take part. 
there were very few limitations or rules set up for the competition. On December the 18th, 2002, the seven teams were asked to make a public presentation broadcast live on television, as well as set up an exhibition at the World Financial Win Center Winter Garden. The exhibit was up for a month and drew 100,000 spectators. CNN, the New York Post, did polls showing a strong preference for Lord Foster, Lieberskind, and the Think Team's projects. So much for public participation. I haven't got time to go into the three projects. Foster proposed two enormously tall towers linked together. They were called the Kissing Towers Project really quite a silly project because uh, when you build so much square feet you need to build separately. If you build two towers with this ma massive square footage the chances of you selling enough square footage at a fast enough rate to fill the whole building would be very difficult. So buildings are generally targeted in size. And this is 776 feet high, which uh, twinned. Anyway, the Think term Teams group proposed a mega structure. Their scheme was called not the Kissing Towers, but the cultural center. There would be the tallest building in the world, of course. There would be a great hall, 30 stories above the ground level, covering 13 acres of open space. The stainless steel system would hold this, these towers up in place. There was a certain tra transparency. They claimed that the scheme resembled the Eiffel Tower, which is very difficult to understand. Then there was Daniel Lieberskin, a Polish-born Jew whose parents died in the Holocaust. He made his presentation at the Winter Garden by relating his vision of the Statue of Liberty when he immigrated to New York. Norman Foster used a video of a little girl in a red dress as an important part of his presentation. All of this has been written about the books about the story, all about the kind of commodification of the... Six weeks after the Winter Garden, two were chosen, Liebeskind and Think, Think, the committee, final committee, preferred the think scheme. The New York Times preferred the think scheme. And Rafael Vignoli, the head of the team, went to bed on the Thursday night, assuming that his project is, was, had won. He got a phone call at breakfast the next morning to say that the governor had preferred Liebeskin's scheme. And the governor had greater power than the mayor and so Lieberskin was chosen. Before the catastrophe, Silverstein, the real estate developer, had already hired SOM to build a new building for him. SOM coyly didn't take part in the competition. He emerged politically as the great force David Charles of SOM produced what he called the Freedom Tower. They asked that Lieberskin, Lieberskin was uh, given 49% of the commission. And they pushed him out. And we now have the 1776 foot high Freedom Tower as a result of this complex interrelationship between the media, uh, the, the The Morning Relatives uh, got a f 
the result of a competition of a memorial space. Calatrava was uh, chosen to do the train station, and that's where it stands at the moment. What's it going to matter to, in 25 years' time? Nobody will know this story. We are only rehearsing this story to put you in a position of, critic, of being critical of ways in which it could be done better. This is a completely bungled, amateurish kind of claptrap op operation. The problem of choosing major monuments the Eiffel Tower occurred through the genius of an undistinguished French structural engineer. The Ferris wheel came from an from a undistinguished, both in competition. No, the Eiffel Tower was in competition, sorry. The Ferris wheel for Chicago. The Statue of Liberty was a donation by the French government to the America, not even an American product. And every baseball game starts with the singing of the national anthem. God alone knows why. And the foreign-born Statue of Liberty is still the single evidence of American democracy in physical form. Where does it leave us theorists? You work on the stochastic opportunity that competitions have. The young Asian immigrant to the United States will come up with a brilliant solution to the Vietnam War competition, putting the names of all the people who died on the facade so that Generations of children will be able to recognize their family name against this simple embodiment of a single monument. Maybe that's what the human species is all about, all we can do. I don't know. I'm not empowered by the story that I've just told you. It seems to me to have all kinds of... I don't know if Robert Moses would have done better had he been in power. After all, perhaps the form doesn't matter that much. I keep on remembering what Khrushchev said looking back on Stalin's attempt to build Yermontov, well, not attempt, he's building of Yermontov University, decorated to hell and looking like a large cathedral set of buildings and so on, with me, filled with decorative systems. Khrushchev said, if we'd have built simple buildings, we could have employed, we could have housed 300,000 more students. Let's forget about all of this monumental nonsense. I'm asking questions which are very difficult to answer. I'm sorry. It's not what I'm here for. I'm supposed to tell you what to do. But all I can point out is that society doesn't know what it wants to do. And maybe in a democracy that's all that matters that you're always alive to opportunities and you do the best you can. And if you believe in perfection, for stop being a member of society, become a hermit. That the failures of democracy are only, if, are only tolerable if they are temporary, I suppose. The, gun, the arguments about gun control in this country 
are insane. The evidence is violently against it. Ninety percent of the population wants some background checks on guns. At the same time, time we're going to probably move towards national legislation in favor of same-sex marriages, which 25 years ago in this democracy would have sounded insane. So I'm arguing that there may be some r relief for us in assuming that it, uh, we are only elements in the democratic system. And provided we maintain the democratic system, we can use our imagination as best we can to fulfill obligations of giving form to societal needs. I'm just going to mention very briefly, because we've got to look at pictures, uh, Another way of dealing with uh, in a democratic society is redressing social imbalances. That's what's commonly known as uh, what's what's the term now? Anyway, it argues that. In a democratic society, groups have equal access, don't have equal access to support systems. So the case where this form of planning really originally starts in Lupo's book, very good book, the story is very well explained. The highway system four ninety five, one twenty eight. A proposition exists for building an inner belt highway through Cambridge to make linkages of all kinds which towards the main roads, uh, expressways towards the west and the south and the north of course. The question of where this inner belt should run is at issue. One of the candidates is the railway, uh, rail line just running next to MIT. MIT objects. It makes a foolish decision to hire an Irish lawyer who in the court, uh, in, the, in, the, in the hearing, <coughs> says that MIT cannot stand having a high automobile so close because it's got its sensitive laboratories the Magnet Laboratory, which is helping our troops in Vietnam, when MIT has claimed that it has nothing to do with the Vietnam War at all. So MIT is embarrassed publicly <laughs> and loses. One of our colleagues here, Bob Goodman, on the faculty, goes out and forms a group, takes a bunch of professionals with him, and they form a group Advocacy planning is the term I was looking for. Advocating the rights of the people in Cambridge Port who don't want the highway at all. Finally, they win, and there's no highway built, and Cambridge is a different city altogether than if it, than what would have been with a tunnel, not a tunnel, a, wolf, a cut in the earth running through either next to MIT or... So what, is, what, what has taken place? A professional has given support to a group 
who don't normally have professional support in a public cont content situation of public contention. The other group deals with the education of people. There's a whole variety of types. There's political education, the project of uh, Giancarlo de Carlos for steel workers in Terni, in southern Italy, not southern Italy, middle Italy, uh, where he's asked to design workers' housing. He has these public meetings and designs certain types of housing. When the people complain that he's for giving them too much space, he says, you're stupid. You should argue for more space. If you're wealthy, you don't, all of you don't have to get up at the same time and to use the bathroom. If you, you need two, two, two bathrooms per family if you're poor. It goes on and on and the people take this up. He designs the situation and gets away with it. Um, there's information giving, telling people about the city. A good city is one in which people are well informed. Patrick Getty's Outlook Tower, the IBA in Berlin, uh, Media City, City of Benign Consumerism, Signs and Lights Project, Yellow Pages, opening up the city's resources. The visible city is the idea, the, you, the city is a schoolroom. Let's look at some of these. This is a project in Terni. I'm just going to run through the, these early ones. The project in Terni, the housing which was built. You can argue against the use of concrete in this form fixed when an environment of greater flexibility. These are some other examples of small town. This is in York, Pennsylvania, the redevelopment of the renewal of a rundown town square, people being shown drawings and asked to learn about the place and give their opinion next. Bologna, Red Bologna. <laughs> Suburban housing and the redevelopment of parts of the, the center of the city next. The redevelopment proposals forced by people argue for maintaining the facade, existing facade of the buildings, the housing, but they're putting in into a new typology of larger space behind. So that you get this idea of almost the exact counterpart of this original streets, but de in depth in increased. Um, next. Pittsburgh, an attempt to build a model of the neighborhood that's being going to be renewed in an attempt to actually have people participate spatially and physically in the space. Next. The kind of, this is an Italian hill town in the Abruzzi. Uh, this is an architect, Belgian architect by the name of Kral, building for Leuven University, in which he imitates the individual uh, anarchy of each builder of the house in the left in an attempt to choose a system of formal randomness to give his facade a particular quality. This is a student dormitory like any student dormitory in the world. That's a town that's built up by a process of 
adjustment and change over time. Next. Robert Moses and three presidents. Major figures are always large, and they're always photographed to make them seem larger. I wonder who's a small dictator. Next. These are from Caro's book. This is a proposition showing a dotted line for the Long Island Expressway. And the actual route that's chosen is contoured by it missing all of the property, almost all of the property, in large holdings by wealthy people. Next. I haven't got time to go into the detail. That's Moses' proposal to build a bridge and uh, his depiction of the bridge in public uh, in the upper two diagrams, whereas the lower diagram in, in fact impacts, shows its impact on the city more dramatically. Next. This is an MIT, this we're talking about the education now. This is an MIT project called Signs and Lights, which says one of the things we can do is create much more intelligence in, uh, in the built form of the environment. Number one, on the, the project on the right argues for the coloring of the road surface to provide, to indicate that you can travel at different speeds. Next, a project in Genoa in Italy in which a neighborhood is cleared and only the fossils, the essential elements of the neighborhood are maintained, giving the people an understanding of what they've got to work with. On the basis of that understanding, their participatory actions create changes produce changes which are on the right. Next. Cedric Price's work in England, the, the idea of building places where people can, this is prior to social media, this is where actually making places in the city, the, the one on the right is called the Fun Palace, and the one uh, on the left is called the Interaction Center, where people who randomly could meet each other and partake of, of joyous activity. Next. This is a Bedford-Stuyvesant New York project, uh, the Ford Foundation study, uh, which is interesting. Um, the project is to insert a new community college in a very poor area uh, and instead of building a new campus uh, with glass buildings and uh, the form of the, building, the inserted buildings are within the existing framework of the town. Um, the All the facilities that are built for the community college are shared by the community. In fact, the curriculum for the community college is set by the needs of the community. The sports facilities up on the top and the left are all party for the community, party for the students. Next. The park. The Philadelphia on the left, the city, the school without walls, the universe, the, the, the city has got enough input, education input in it to serve as, as a school. Next, Metro Education Project in Montreal, which argues that you can uh, stop building schools and utilize 
meetings and connections with people in the city itself. For instance, up there is a meeting with a professor who's a big businessman. And so the subway system becomes a um, method of utilizing all of the available space which can serve dual mode uses. Next. Oh, well, we can leave MIT. The extraordinary thing is that this was uh, 20 years ago, probably. I'm trying to read what it says at the top. To leave the white walls gray or paint them white is vandalism. Your environment is changing. Get yourself, get together with it. No one knows better how to create your environment than you do. Does your environment respond to your needs? What a statement of anarchic invitation. <laughs> this is one of the posters which I photographed at the time. Next. Up against the Wall Street Journal, an urban imperialist. This is a time when the form of the city was politically significant to the students in the two universities. Next. Here he was MIT's real estate boss. Next. The university in response, the university in the city, Harvard's the university in the city, these are all university reports saying how great things are. Next. There's a thesis done by Monica Unger called The Politics of Urbanity on the history of the attempts in Brussels after the Manhattan Plan to respond vigorously to the plan. The plan was to internationalize Brussels with tall buildings as the center of the European market. And here are posters emanating <laughs> from this society itself saying no to Creer, no to Venturi and Rauch, no to Chernikov, no to Crawl. Next. Posters which set out the way in which local neighborhood should be fixed. A whole set of items like this monthly magazine for the urban struggles, information about the development projects in Brussels, the work of inhabitants committees, theater, schools of architecture, cinema, arts museums, all taking, being formed together to form a protest environment with educational material in the form of daily posters on the left. Next. So all of this last stuff is an attempt to influence the form of the city, often stopping negative things from happening. <coughs> 